Sunday worship service, I am licensed minister Cindy Lemke, serving First Congregational United Church of Christ from Wadena, Minnesota. I am glad to be sharing this time with you. These are strange and difficult times because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet in spite of the necessity to worship together from a distance, there are many things to be grateful for. The daylight hours are getting longer. The winter snows are gradually disappearing. Just yesterday, our son who lives in Wisconsin shared that his tulips are beginning to poke through the recently thawed soil. Each morning and evening, songbirds of all kinds can be heard singing their springtime greetings. Let us remember, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We gather together in this time with glad anticipation as we recall palm branches fanning the air in praise. We gather together in peace, waiting with great expectation to see Jesus, eager for a healing touch, a blessing received. We gather together joyful as we see in our mind's eye palm branches reaching high with hope. We gather together in this time, each in our own holy space, anxious as the palm branches are still, questioning if we are able to walk with Jesus through the week ahead, through anguish, accusations, despair, and darkness. We gather together, walking towards Easter, while waving branches of prayer. Let us take on an attitude of prayer. Hosanna, O oh God in the highest, how you come to us in ways we never expect. How is a king on a donkey? How can a savior be hung on a cross? How do we see you when we are only trained to see defeat in these actions? In this week ahead, we will see you with us, among us. Will your message come through? Will the palms we wave with joy today be thrown tomorrow with doubt? May your spirit guide us through this holiest of weeks. Beside us, around us, before, behind, and within us. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today comes from Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2, 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our second reading today comes from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. 
A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. As we enter this time of prayer, I would like to share with you today a prayer that was written by our conference minister, Reverend Sherry Prestema. I must say that Sherry has been a wonderful support and inspiration during this time. Here is Sherry's prayer. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. You have promised your presence with us in all of life in seasons of want <clears throat> and seasons of plenty, in times of despair and times of hope. We need you now so fiercely, O oh God. Abide with us, we pray. Visit us in the moments when our fears overtake us, when our hearts tremble with anxiety and we can see no end in sight to the surreal madness of this moment. Calm our spirits when the forced need, when the forced need to stay at home drives us crazy when we yearn for the freedom we previously took for granted, when the walls press in around us and days mercilessly drag on. Bind us together in heart and mind with our beloveds, the ones within our homes and the ones now made distant but distant by circumstance. Receive our plaintive petitions to watch over them by day and by night. Protect their health and guard their choices. When our isolation becomes unbearable, when loneliness overwhelms us and tears slip unbidden from our eyes, draw near to us and embrace us with your constant love and comfort. When our best efforts fail to control the chaotic, when we fall exhausted from our worry and waiting, help us breathe deeply of your spirit and bless us with unbroken sleep. And for those who cannot stay home but wade each day into the front lines of risk while daring to serve and care for others, we give you thanks and ask your tender blessing. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. You are our shelter from the stormy blasts of life. You are our home at the beginning and end of every day. In you we trust and on your steadfast love and mercy we rely. Dwell with us in these unsettling days and hear our every prayer. In the name of Jesus, who lived among us and understands our suffering. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. During this time of distance worship, our offering needs to take a little different approach. We obviously are not in our usual worship space. The ushers will not be coming forward with the offering plates, and you will not be physically placing your offering into the plate as you pass it to your neighbor in the pew. But we are still able to show our appreciation for all that God provides. Maybe it is through the act of prayer or by checking on one another during this time of physical distancing. Perhaps it is running an errand for someone for whom it is important to stay home. One of my favorite lessons about giving is the example a dear friend has shared with the church school children. Even though you may not have coins to place in the basket, you always have yourself to give. So as the basket is passed, make an offering of yourself by taking from your heart and placing it in the basket as it comes to you. Let us give of ourselves this morning. Holy God, as we offer our very selves to you, receive this offering as the first measure of our gratitude for all that you are and all that you have done for us. Help us to sing a song of gratitude each and every day of our lives. Amen. From just before my fifth birthday in the summer of 1967 until just before my 10th birthday in 1972, my family and I lived at 514 North Sibley Avenue in Litchfield, Minnesota. If any of you are familiar with the community of Litchfield, Sibley Avenue, or Highway 22, also serves as Litchfield's main street. Needless to say, the street in front of our home was very busy, and as a young child, I was not allowed to cross it alone. I remember the constant hum of the passing cars and trucks as they drove past our home each and every day. But even with the street crossing limitations and the steady rumble of the traffic, I have fond memories of that home on North Sibley Avenue. During the Christmas season, the town's Christmas decorations, as in many communities, were hung across the, the highway from light pole to light pole. And at night, I could look out our upstairs bathroom window and see the green swag of garland as it was lit up with the colors of Christmas. In the summer, on the Sunday afternoon of water cake days, the annual water day cake parade would pass right by our house. Each year, we would set our lawn chairs and blankets on the curb outside our front door in anticipation of the parade. The floats, the bands, the honor guards, the shriners in their little cars, the police cars, fire trucks, and horses that make up any community parade all passed right by our home. I loved every minute of the anticipation of and the participation in the excitement that that annual event represented in that time of my, of my life. Today is Palm Sunday, and as we read our scriptures, the liturgy of the Palms from Psalm 118 and Matthew 21, we are reminded of celebrations and parades of gathered crowds and spirited, act all spirited and acting with enthusiasm and filled with hope. On this Sunday, there are two lectionary paths to choose from, the Liturgy of the Palms and the Liturgy of the Passion. One path, the one I have chosen for today, Matthew 21, describes to us Jesus' triumphal entry through the gates of Jerusalem. The second path, the Liturgy of the Passion, begins with Jesus' trial before Pilate and ends with his death upon the cross. A death that in Matthew's Gospel ends with the temple curtain being torn in two, the earth shaking, and the Roman centurion proclaiming, 
truly this man was God's son. It is a tough decision. Some years I have gone with the liturgy of the palms readings, and other years I have chosen to follow the passion readings. This year, because of this faith community's tradition, I have chosen the liturgy of the palms. Each year, the church school kids and the choir have come forward singing an introit, waving palms and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Each year, the choir's sung anthem has been the palms. And this year, with all that is happening in our world due to the COVID-19 pandemic, with the need for physical distancing, it seemed to me that the comfort of tradition was one way we could feel connected even while worshiping apart. During year A, the Lenten lectionary presents us with readings from, gospels, from the Gospels of John and Matthew. From the narrative of Nicodemus, through the story of the raising of Lazarus, Jesus has been performing signs which were designed by the Gospel writer to point us in the direction of recognizing Jesus as God's Son, sent by God to, to us, to the promise, giving us the promise of new life in God, a life focused on God's will for our lives and the lives of all God's people. Included in the promise of this new life, as people were willing to accept it, were the religious establishment, as represented by Nicodemus, those who live outside the perimeter, as represented by the Samaritan woman at the well, those who exist on the edges of the perimeter, the Jewish man blind since birth, and even those who are included within the perimeter, but for whatever reason are so bound up and living only a partial existence within the culture that they are supposed to be a part of. Today's scriptures do the same thing. They point us in a direction which leads us to an understanding of Jesus and the purpose of the life he lived. In the liturgy of the Passion, which begins with Matthew 27, 11, and Matthew 27, 11, 54. It is the imagery of the torn temple curtain, the shaking of the earth and the Roman centurion's terrified proclamation. Truly, this man was God's son. They give us the final word on Jesus' identity. In Matthew's liturgy of the song of the Palms, today's gospel reading, it is the crowds that lead us to the meaning of Jesus' life. The crowd or crowds which function as a character throughout the narrative of Matthew's gospel story. The crowd which, according to Audrey West in her Feasting on the Word commentary, represents Jesus' disciples and knots in total. A discipleship that we today can become a part of as we experience the scripture lesson for today. The crowd's activity begins in Matthew 4, verse 25, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when the people first appeared and began following him. From Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan, the people came. As a group, they are repeatedly astounded by his authority through his teaching, Matthew 7, 28-29. His, his healing ability when he commands the paralytic to walk, Matthew 9, 8, and in, and in his answers when being questioned by the religious authorities in Matthew 22, verse 33. Their astonishment continued in the, in, as they witnessed Jesus' capacity to heal the sick among them, as found in chapters 12, 14, 15, and 19. And they are amazed as he casts out demons, as reported in Matthew 9, verse 33. Never has anything like this been seen in Israel. Before the triumphal entry, the hungry crowds have had their bellies filled twice. Matthew 14, 13 through 21, and chapter 15, 32 through 39, with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Why wouldn't they show such enthusiasm when Jesus rides into the city? The communal emphasis of the crowd's presence is unmistakable 
as it reveals the uncommon courage of common folks who, as another feasting on the word commentator, Veronica Miles writes, have experienced a presence so powerful, a message so compelling, and a love so complete that they transgress the boundaries of religious and civil acceptability to make the journey to Jerusalem with Jesus. All of them, all of us, in need of the life-sustaining sustenance that Jesus so freely gives. Something to keep in mind is that the gospel stories, all of them were written at least a full generation following Jesus' death. So the words that these scriptures were, the stories that the people that these scriptures were written for are not the same people that we hear about in the narrative. The first intended audience of these narratives were people who were followers of the way, the early roots of what is now our Christian church. The followers of the way continued to be victims of Roman rule and likely the broken religious system that Jesus was at odds with during most of his ministry. For this audience, the imagery such as the use of language and references which came from their earliest scriptures and the narrative history those scriptures recorded would have been key in providing their understanding of the themes presented in the Gospel according to Matthew. For example, the timing of Jesus' procession during the festival of the Passover would recall the freeing of the Hebrew people from the oppression of Egyptian slavery, a story of rescue and hope as the once enslaved people journey to become a nation of their own. Matthew's intended readers also lived during a time when they were held captive by an oppressive government the Roman Empire, and they were also suffering, suffering under religious persecution from the established religious order of first century Christianity. The cries of Jesus, the cries to Jesus of Hosanna, which is Aramaic for save us, would recall the prayerful tone of verse 25 from today's psalm, save us we beseech you, O Lord. A psalm which recounts the entrance of an, of an earlier king, an entrance made through another gate of perhaps King David, who in verse 26 of Psalm 118 is understood to be blessed and who comes in the name of the Lord. And as the early, as the original readers or more likely listeners of Matthew's gospel are remembering back to the meaning of these words, it would be natural for them to celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry then, just as we celebrate that same entry today. Who among the assembled crowds can be anything but jubilant at the psalmist's remembered words as they begin and end this thank-filled psalm? I'll give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. We hear these words today while living in a state of concern and anxiety due to the coronavirus pandemic. The sanctuary that I stand in this morning is empty, except for Tanya and Lee, who are helping create the ability for this service to be shared out there with all of you. Thank you, Tanya and Lee. Living in a state of anxiety is not a new occurrence in the lives of God's people. The followers of the way, Jesus on the borrowed, borrowed donkey, and those gathered waving palms and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, were all taking risks. They were hoping for a day when they would be allowed to live the lives that God intended for all God's people. They were longing for a time when they would no longer be persecuted for their faith or oppressed due to foreign occupation. They were they were looking forward to a time when they could just be themselves, together, in relationship. Sermon Seed's author, Catherine Matthews, borrows an excerpt from a book written by theologians Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. In their book, Borg and Crossan describe two processions into Jerusalem that day. Now, earlier this week, I asked some of the youth to help out with 
with today's service by creating models of the two processions that Borg and Crossan describe. Thank you, Dreamer and Preston. The first procession doesn't appear in today's scripture reading, but was likely a scene that the Jewish people of Jerusalem had experienced on numerous occasions. Dreamer's model shows us this procession. According to Borg and Croson, this procession came from the west and was led by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. The materialistic parade came into the city to keep the peace. More, more, but more accurately, to keep order during the Passover. The Jewish High Holy Day celebrating Israel's long ago release from captivity in the Egyptian Empire. If you look at Dreamer's model, you can see some of the things that would have been present in that procession. It's a visual parade of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, some glinting on metal and gold, sounds of the marching feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the eyes of the silent onlookers, some curious, some odd, some resentful. This was the power of empire on display. But it was also a kind of theology, a, a way to think about a God, because the Roman emperor claimed to be the son of God. So the way things were, were that way because their God, with a little g, decided it should be so. It works out well for the Romans and the wealthy, but not so much for the people under their heel. Preston created the other procession. It is a very different procession. It came from the east and is the one we read about in today's Gospel lesson. This king rides in, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. Surrounded not by cavalry or foot soldiers with helmets and banners, but by peasants, the urban poor, and the spiritually hungry, holding palm branches and exuberantly waving them. They are full of praise and hope that has been kept alive by those prophets who promised a time of peace and, and justice, and a leader who would inaugurate that great and glorious day. This small procession was a big statement, a statement in opposition to the power and oppression represented by Pilate's flashier, more noticeable procession. But the procession called attention to the unrest that existed in Jerusalem, unrest caused by tyranny and injustice and the fact that it was a very difficult time. We are living in difficult and, and uncertain times yet. We are called to see and feel hope. We look back to these scriptures and the narrative they tell us as a source of that hope. The people who Matthew wrote for did the same. The liturgy of the poems from the Gospel of Matthew with its allusions to what we now refer to as our Old Testament scriptures provides us the framework for its original audience as well as for all future audiences to draw on their past to provide hope for their present. Again, with today's Matthew reading, we discover the reason for the crowd's confidence and hope in the, in the man who rides through the city's gates on the back of a lowly donkey. From the book of the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9, and is written in verse 5 of today's Matthew, Matthew's reading, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These are difficult and necessarily physically isolated times. It is hard, but we know that Jesus' triumphal entry today changes rapidly to a difficult and dark week of table turning, final meals, betrayal, arrest, and death by crucifixion. We know this, but for today, let us gain strength for the journey by filling ourselves with the thankful and continually hope-filled words for today. Let those words help us to step into the struggles that we 
ourselves face as a community, a nation, and a world. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us join again in a spirit of prayer as I share with you a prayer written for the United Methodist Discipleship Ministries by Dr. Cynthia A. Wilson. Lord God, you are good. Your goodness never ends. Here we are, God. The crowd has thinned out. It is eerily quiet. The air has shifted. The palms have been trampled. The sky is gray. The joy has disappeared. The voices of victory are silent. The celebration for the arrival of our long-awaited messianic hope is waning. The road ahead is long, but we are able. It is the way of suffering. We are able. Mold us and make us like the divine. Even in our human frailty, you are still good. Even in our doubts, you are still good. Even in the face of betrayal, you are still good. We place our lives in your hands because you are still good, and your goodness never ends. And so we cry, Hosanna. Amen. Let us depart from this worship in the hope and peace that only God and Jesus, the Anointed One, can provide. <laughs> 